Let's look at some basic practicing stuff. I think this statement, evangelicalism has a 500-year history of making Christianity a mainly rational theology understanding about God rather than actual personal relationship. And we all come from a background that probably that is not very experiential, you know, from if you come from that evangelical perspective, which I came out of, it was all about the word and you didn't need to have any experience of it. You just believed it and that was it, you know. So, yeah, we need to live in encounter with the living God and that beats theology about him. If you know him, it beats all the theology in the world of theory when you know him. You know, and I, I'm convinced that we need to totally redefine how people get saved to not praying a prayer, but having an encounter with God. Because when people get saved with an encounter with God, then all the other encounters are really easy. Yeah. When you get someone to pray a prayer and you're never sure whether they meant it or not, you're not sure what happened spiritually. But if you get them to come and, I don't know, meet the father like the prodigal and yeah. receive open arm hug and a new robe and everything that goes with it and they experience that and have an encounter with it and it's just like now you're going to feel God hug you and you're going to feel all your sin just be washed away and you're going to feel this and, and it's like and they do then it totally changes everything else you know when we did we started to do everything experientially so we had like baptism services it's like no heaven's open and now you're going to hear God come and affirm you and say you know, you're you're his child and then you know when you stand in the water it's like there's a totally different dynamic to it that becomes experiential and god wants everything to be experiential really um, so you know the whole thing of mystic and mystical you know I, I you have a lot of people who use mystic and mystical just to get a rise out of the religious system which to be honest is is not really a very good motive for doing it and actually can put off as many people as it makes people have a laugh. Um, but, you know, ecstatic, ecstasy, you know, they're often seen as negative. Why? Well, because they're painted in a view which paints it in, well, that's weird, new age, occult, you know, because, well, we just believe the word. So there's a, there's a whole thing in there. But, you know, what does mystical mean? It just it means euphoric, blissful, joyous, elated. Well, why wouldn't I want to be that? You know, it's like in reality, when you get people question, well, this is a bit off. It's like, why wouldn't I want to be euphoric, blissful, joyous and elated all the time and live in the joy of my salvation, which I'm supposed to live in? You know, so trances, visions, out of body experiences, they're treated with suspicion, but they're obviously all in the Bible. And if you're going to you know, help people with this stuff, I would encourage you to find some proof texts, which are just things that you can say, well... Trances, no, you shouldn't have that. Well, what about Peter? You know, he, he fell into a trance and actually changed the whole course of Christianity because yeah. yeah. it let the Gentiles in. And he received that in a visionary trance. So how's about that one? You know, because, <laughs> well, no, because it's dangerous. You know, and you've got you've to sort of help people to overcome some of those things by a, sharing your own personal experiences, but actually knowing where there is and where they are in the Word of God. You know, it's like is Ezekiel pulled out of his body by a lock of his hair and taken to Jerusalem while his body's still by the river with the elders. I wonder what they thought. You know, was he still there? Was he was he gone and in a trance? You know, did he carry on talking to them and his spirit somewhere else? You know, it didn't go into it, but you know, it's one of those things if you if you fancy go on the timeline and go and have a look. You know, it could be quite interesting. Um, but there's a lot of things that we need to encourage and there's a lot of things we need to be careful of that we don't induce trances you know you don't induce a trance you don't chant or empty your mind to induce a trance if god takes you into a trance that's great but actually you can step into the realm of heaven anytime you want to you don't need to be in a trance you know and i've had discussions with people about well just get whacked in the spirit and yeah everything's great well, that's okay. I mean, I like getting whacked in the spirit as much as anyone else. But I can't do that when I'm driving down the road. You know? 
you know, I can't go into a trance while I'm driving down the road either. And this, an angel suddenly takes the wheel of the car and starts steering it. So you have to be able to engage in these supernatural things in normal life, you know, and it, it, you can't just be whacked in the spirit. And actually, you know, I look at Jesus, he, he didn't go around being whacked in the spirit, <laughs> you know. And so some of these things can, can just become off, out of balance, you know. It's like, and I've, I've encountered groups where everyone was getting whacked in the spirit and getting some sort of spiritual experiences, but they all wanted to know what they meant. So they were asking me, who was sat there, not whacked in the spirit, just having my own, enjoying all my time with God. And they would come out and say, well, what does this mean? And what does that mean? I said, well, why don't you ask the people who just want you to get whacked in the spirit to help you understand what it is that you're experiencing? Or they won't do that. They just want us to get whacked in the spirit. You know, and, and to be honest, it's like, there's a place for that. And it's really great. But actually, it's not normal life. Your normal life is I'm in heaven, you know, and actually I'm here doing a lot of other things while I'm in heaven. And that's what I see Jesus doing, you know, and he was full of joy, you know, and you can be full of joy without being rolling drunk, you know. And so, you know, don't try and think you have to create something to enter into this. You don't. You can just normally learn how to engage in the realm of the spirit any time. You know, and even if people say to me, well, I'm just doing it by faith. You know, I hear that a lot on mentoring sessions and stuff. I'm just doing it by faith. I said, and don't I do it by faith? Because if I don't do it by faith, I'm not going to please God anyway. So I'm going to do it by faith. My faith is I can step into heaven. So I do, you know, and then people say, well, I'm just doing it by my imagination. So, well, what's the problem with that? That's what it's for. Everything's in your imagination. It's a screen in your brain that everything operates on. So there's a, sort of a lot of stuff around it that people think if they don't get a full-on first person, I'm in a trance and it's not real or valid. And that isn't true. At the end of the day, the bottom line in all spiritual encounters and experiences is the revelation of the perception that you've received. So that you know that you know, not the encounter or experience in itself which is why I don't chase experience. I just want to meet with God and talk to him and have an experience of personally connecting with him in intimacy. And it doesn't matter whether I'm in a euphoric state or whether I'm just sit down normally talking to God and having a normal conversation like I would with anyone else. The point is, at the end of the day, he's spoken to me and I've heard him or he's shown me something and I've seen. You know, and even seeing... We have to be really careful that we don't try and only believe what we see in a vision. Because you can have a vision and have no idea what it means. And then you need an interpretation of the vision because you've had an experience, but you don't have revelation of the experience and you've got to go and find it out. So to be honest, most of my experiences are not visual in the normal sense of the word my spirit has you know i've trained my spirit to interpret what it's seeing and inform me so by a way of interpreting that as knowing in my mind so i can describe it very visually but i can do that with my eyes open you know to engage your imagination you need to close your eyes now that does slow down your brain waves and you get a more intuitive access but I can't do that if my eyes are open so if I want my spirit to be in, engaged in heaven while I'm engaging things here then I need to learn how to do it with my eyes open which means I'm not going to see it in the same way because I'm seeing things already on that screen <coughs> so I need the other side of the screen to essentially receive the revelation that knows what it is so right now if I was to describe where my spirit is I can do it because I'm looking at you and seeing all the information that's coming from the outside in, but I'm also getting information from the inside out that goes on the other side of the screen. So I interpret it. My brain has learned to interpret what it's see seeing from a perspective of knowing. And I describe it as I know. So my spirit knows. Now, if I shut my eyes, I can, I can see 
because I've also trained my imagination to picture and see, but I don't need to do it. And majority of times I don't because actually I want to do other things at the same time. You know, and that, that becomes something which you can live in dual realms. You know, Jesus didn't walk around with his eyes closed, you know, but he was totally connected to seeing what the Father was doing and doing it. You know, and people, people have asked me, well, did Jesus go in the morning and sort of get everything he was going to do in the day? And that was what he meant by seeing. And you know, I said, well, I don't know, go and ask him, you know, because <laughs> it's like, you know, because in reality, he was there in the spirit. So it was a ongoing connection. You know, it wasn't something you can go and find out and get your mandate in the morning, whatever. But, you know, I don't want to step in and step out. I want to step in and stay in. You know, the only time I step back in is the next morning because I go to sleep and, and my spirit is available for God to use all night. And when I wake up in the morning, then I want to actively choose for the day to open my first love gate and engage by surrendering myself for the day. And I step back in and do whatever I do there. You know, so it becomes a relationship um, that's normally supernatural. You know, it isn't something that's weird. Not to me anymore. It might be weird to others, but for me, it's not weird because I don't act weird. Well, I don't think I do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I might say some weird things, um, but it's very much just normal. And that's what I believe it should be because then we can just be normal and not put people off. You know, why shouldn't, why should we be weird to put people off? When we can be normal and, you know, we were talking in the car about, you know, God giving people revelation and getting all the jing language out of it and all the sort of Christianese so that we can just relate to people right. and relate to people in a language that they understand because God will give us that to speak to them. And that we then are sort of flowing with the life of God rather than it being something that's something we do rather than who we are. Because we can all try and do things, um, but we need to be yeah. so you know i encourage people to be open for spiritual experiences but not try and induce them you know because there is then a danger that you're trying to create something and then you begin to strive for it and struggle for it rather than just relax because the more you struggle and strive the harder it is and the more relaxed you are even even sort of physiologically your right side of your brain works better when you're relaxed because it assumes that it's going to need that side filled with blood. So blood pumps to the right side of the brain when you're relaxed. The left side of the brain gets more brain when you're more access because when you want to figure something out because you're working on something and trying to analyze something, then the right side of the brain operates in creative stuff, left brain in analytical stuff. And technically, as soon as you cl close your eyes, you're shutting off the analytical. And so you need to learn not to try and have your brain full of stuff when you close your eyes. You know, it's like relax. You know, learn just to relax and it's much easier to engage when, when you do that. Um, so, you know, mystic, mystical is difficult for many people. You know, and the, the definition of is it the belief that direct knowledge of God, spiritual truth or ultimate reality can be attained through subjective experience as intuition or insight. Well, I don't have any problem with that definition. You know, why would that be an issue? You know, but the word has been used in a negative way, which it, it really isn't. Uh, Mark Verkler said this, or God said to him, you can trust my voice in your heart more than you can trust the reason theology of your mind. Come on. You know, and God said that to him, direct. And I think, well, yeah, that's really true. You know, we're so used to thinking that that reason theology is more correct because it's based in the word, when, and we don't trust that God is going to speak to us. And Jesus said, you know, who asks their father for a fish or something and he's going to give them a stone? Yeah. You know, why do we assume that the devil's going to have more authority or more access to deceive us than God has to bless us? You know, so when we ask him for blessing, we need to be in faith to receive blessing and not be concerned that we're going to be led astray. Because you know, we won't. 
you know. Now, that's not to say that you don't share things with each other and weigh them. And it's like, what do you think of this experience? And it's like, oh, that's really cool. And it's like, and sometimes it's like we need to help to understand things and being in a relationship where you can share openly with people is really helpful. You know, because a lot of people don't know who to talk about some of these things and therefore they sort of bottle it all up and, you know, haven't got no outlet for it. And we need to find, obviously, people that we can talk to and share because um, that helps sometimes spark creativity when you talk and share and it opens up, you know, sort of the reality of some of the things that we're experiencing. So, um, you know, another definition is a person who tries to gain religious or spiritual knowledge through prayer and deep thought. Well... Again, you know, I haven't got too much problem with that definition. A person who claims to attain or believes the possibility of attaining insight or mysteries, transcending ordinary human knowledge as by direct communication with God. And that's a good one. I and mean, for me, it's like, yeah, I would love to have direct insight and mysteries come from direct communication with God. So, you know, when people say mis mystical to you or you're into the mystical stuff, she said, well, there's a definition. What do you think of that? Yeah, so some of these things are helpful to have just as things that you can help people to overcome some of the negative things that are out there that will religion will put over people. So, you know, don't get all weird on people. Because if you get weird on people, they will think this is all weird. But and I think actually, there's a this counterfeit is... definition to that that uses, as you say, the New Age movement or anything else, yeah. which actually takes out that last, you know, three words in each part of it or two, and that's with God. Yeah. And so they put it upon themselves, and they're the mystic. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we come into that yeah. axiom of, okay, that's wrong, or it's subjective. Yeah. And when it looks like that, therefore it's wrong. Mm. And I think in anything, you've got to look at things are counterfeit. You don't counterfeit something that's worth nothing. You know, you don't go counterfeit in pennies. You counterfeit $100 notes. You know, because they're worth something. They have greater value the enemy doesn't counterfeit something that's no good. Yeah. You know, so you don't find too much religious stuff out there in that movement. <laughs> you know, you know. Not a whole lot of church stuff there. No. <laughs> you know, but there obviously, yes, there is counterfeit, but that doesn't, in fact, all that does is mean that there is real. Yes. If there is a counterfeit, then there is always going to be a real that you need to experience. And we just need to be open to the real experience with God. And if our focus is on about engaging God in relationship, what comes in terms of revelation or knowledge or insight is a byproduct of that. So we're not chasing the experiences or chasing the knowledge. What we want is relationship. And relationship comes, if I'm talking to God and I'm in a relationship with him, well, of course, he's going to share stuff with me. You know, he's going to tell me stuff because actually... I'm his child. You know, what parent doesn't want to talk to their children? Well, some, obviously. <laughs> um, but in general, it's something that you do. And God wants to communicate with us, but he does it in relationship. So, you know, I, I would encourage a lot of this stuff, um, you know, is just, you're going to come up against it more and more because more and more people are going to get these experiences and want help. I mean, I, I fully believe that when we, um, when we see the end of this 40-year generation and God starts to... Um, those who have not been... who've been invited to the wedding feast and have not turned up, um, and he's going to, what, go out to the highways and byways and get a whole lot of other people to come in? You're going to find that the organized sort of churches that are more traditional... In, you know, I don't know what they are in the US, but in, in the UK, we've got, you know, Anglican churches and Methodist churches and other Church. sort of, you know, some of those things. They are going to have visions and encounters and angels and open visions because God is going and they won't have a grid of reference for it, most of them. So they're going to want help and we need to be there yes. to help them. And so we need to understand some of their fears some of their concerns, some of their worries, so that we can be there to help them through that into the experiences. And you know, I had a, a foretaste of this uh, a while ago in that you know, I'm sort of part of a Churches Together group in our, in our area. I, I chaired it for, for five or six years. Um, and 
I I went to a meeting and we were talking about doing stuff in the air and stuff. And I heard I overheard a lady saying, "I had this experience." Yeah, you know, and I heard her vicar say to her, "You need to go and talk to Mike." You know, and I immediately thought, "Well, why don't you tell her?" Oh yeah, because you haven't had those experiences. Um, so next time I saw him, <laughs> I had a word with him, <laughs> and she had she had she was having dreams. And there was very supernatural dreams. And so she was, well, what does this mean? So she came to me. I said, well, you know, well, why don't you just try and talk to God about it and ask him to show you what it means? Because I wanted to encourage her to get a relationship. So then we, um, we did uh, something on Good Friday. We, we have a whole load of crosses and we get all the churches together and we stand in the high street, you know, and stand with the crosses all the way up the high street, just in silence for like 20 minutes. And the whole town just, peace comes over it and people really respect it i mean it was just amazing so i was there and a couple of other guys were close to me and we were we were in heaven while this was going on you know and, and i knew the other guy and, and this lady was standing right in the middle of us and so so when when the 20 minutes was up I, I looked at her and she was in a total ecstatic state like literally and and so she she looked at me and she just came running over and said Ah, 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 I just, I just, I uh, just, this, I've had this thing come to speak to me, and uh, so I was like, so I said, "Oh, calm down. Just tell, tell, tell me what it was." And yeah, she just had a totally open vision, and, and one of the seven spirits of God had come, this the uh, spirit of knowledge, and said it was, it was this color, and and it was like this, and all this happened, and it's like, what does that mean? And I said, "Well, God is inviting you." to take up a heavenly position of government and he wants you to experience this and he wants you to get all your church doing this. So I thought, I'm going to really stir this up. <laughs> and she, because cause that's what the vision was actually saying. It was a call that God was showing her because she, there was the symbolism in it was very much, hey, God is calling you to take your position of government and this is going to be normal for you and this is going to be real for, for others. And, and so I, um, you know, I encouraged her. She's a church warden. So she's technically one of the bench of three in an Anglican church because they have the vicar and two church wardens. So, you know, she's in a, she's in a position where she will share this stuff. And I think that there, that's a forerunner of many people who are going to actually have those sorts of experiences. And they're going to need somebody to, to be able to help them. And then to lead them into living in that lifestyle, because um, God is going to call those who have not yet heard. You know, even though He's called those who have heard, and they've some of them aren't interested. <laughs> you, know? you know, so don't don't be you know too concerned. This this is another definition. Many mystics are broad thinking, intelligent, and have a good grasp of the concepts of infinite infinity and transcendence. And I include myself in that category. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, this, this is a great statement. Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand, while imagination embraces the entire world and all that ever will be to know and understand. And that was Albert Einstein. And he's got some wonderful quotes. Because... Um, you know, he received the theory of relativity in E equals MC squared whilst lying in a meadow. Right. And he, he described it as the thoughts of God dancing in his mind. He didn't receive it while he was writing theory on a board because he understood imagination and how it could unveil things that you don't yet know. And this is another one. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Mm. Albert Einstein. You know, and, you know, probably, you know, one of the most well-renowned scientific minds actually was intuitive in how he received revelation. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a famous picture. Logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. <laughs> So we we have to develop these things, you know. That's God's language, you know. A flow of thoughts, pictures, words, impressions, perception, and it doesn't matter too much which one you get, you know. So you know, just go with what you intuitively experience, and then you can develop the others. 
you know, it's like if you, so long as you tune in, you can develop the other ways of doing it if you want to. You know, I mean, I practiced all of them along the way because it was a journey and I didn't know where I was going. You know, so I didn't know that there were these steps on the journey. It was just, oh, God showed me this. Um, you know, all of it's received and interpreted in our brain. Everything. Everything that is something that's from perceived or thought or heard, whether it's literal now. I mean, literally, you are an image in my brain. I just have learned to interpret that you're sitting where you are through spatial awareness as I've learned to ex understand what I'm seeing. You know, because all it is is a projection of electrical impulses in my brain somewhere that my brain has learned to interpret as everything that I'm seeing now. Now, you have no idea what I'm seeing. You know, I could be seeing you and you look very different from what you think you look like. Because it, it's very subjective, isn't it? You know, you don't know what's going into my brain. And I can be laughing now because of what I'm seeing. You know? <laughs> but everything's interpreted there and it's all on the screen of our imagination. Even what I'm seeing is actually on that screen because that's what it is. It's a screen that, that has a projected image. You know, I've just learned to actually receive everything that's coming out from this way in. And I know that because I've learned over the years to interpret that. We've grown up with it. So we need to relearn. So 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So the real world is actually the eternal world, because this world has only come out of that world in the first place. Everything is spiritual. You know, and I think Rob Bell did a, a, a video called Everything is Spiritual, and it, it went into a really excellent video, and it, it was all about everything is spiritual, because it's all made of spiritual stuff. You know, it's just the way in which we perceive it that makes it, we think it's solid, we know it's not solid. It's 99% empty space. You know, it just appears solid to us because of the vibrational frequency of it. Now, we need to see everything from a, a different perspective. So we look at the unseen with the eyes of our heart, the imagination, or the eyes of our spirit. Um, we look at the seen with our natural eyes. Now, sometimes you get a superimposition of one over the other. You know, sometimes people see things on top of things and and that and you know sometimes you actually see spiritual things with your open eyes sometimes angels make themselves known and you can see them otherwise you wouldn't be able to give them hospi hospitality you know unawares so they don't always look like you know little sweet cherubs um, <laughs> but they never look like little sweet cherubs <laughs> <laughs> so again you know hebrews 5:14 Solid food is for the mature because of practice have trained their senses to discern good and evil. Um, soul and spirit. You know, we need to discern that which is of the soul and that which is of the spirit, and we can practice and learn to do that. Practice means we have to start with desire. You know, you will never get to delight without the discipline that comes in the middle. You know, and that takes time, and it takes choice, and it takes denying the flesh you know when I first started encountering these things um, God said to me you need to do this in the same way everyone else does it and when I said well, what do you mean he said well you know you have the same number of hours in the day but you will be accused because you have time to do this in your working day that it's easy for you so I made a decision there and then that this would be my own personal walk with God so I have to get up early and give that time to God and spend the first, the best of my day with him. And everyone who says, well, I'm not a morning person, just get over yourselves because you need to be. You know, it's like if you do not give yourself time with God at the beginning of the day, then you're not able to frame your day. You know, if you're going to frame your day, you can't do it after it's happened. There's no point framing your night. You know, you need to frame your day, you know. Uh, so we, we have to make decisions and choices. And, you know, I want to sleep in bed as much as anybody else. You know, but in reality, my soul is not in charge. My spirit is. So I desire to be more 
time with God more than I desire the time to sleep. You know, and you do see Jesus getting up early in the morning and going into a place to pray. You know, because sometimes you need to get away from everything. You know, and so having personal intimate time with God to practice is a discipline that you have to develop. You know, it's not just going to happen if you don't spend the time developing it. You know, if you want to be good at anything, you have to practice it. There are some people that are very naturally gifted. And those who are very naturally gifted seers, and they have, you know, that's how they're wired. That's great for them. But they still have to learn how to do this stuff. You know, because you can be a great seer, but it doesn't mean you can engage when you want to. Because you can just see things. But it doesn't mean that you can engage when you want to. You have to learn how to do this. And it takes discipline. But the delight of it when you can do it is worth it all. You know, it's worth all the time that I've spent. You know, I wouldn't change any of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want a shortcut. Because in the journey, you learn. And you grow and you mature. If you, you know, it doesn't come through laying on our hands. You know, it just doesn't. And the whole charismatic movement, I don't think has done Christians an awful lot of favors when it comes to laying hands. I totally believe in impartation, but I believe you can impart a seed. You cannot impart the full grown thing in somebody because it would mean that someone could get it without cost. And then it doesn't mean anything. Something that doesn't cost you anything has no value. So it needs to have value, and you have value because you pay the cost that creates the value, you know, and many people don't want to pay the cost. You know, I know Ian Clayton believes that you won't get more than 10% of the Christian population who will become the Order of Melchizedek. And he uses, you know, some interesting theology to get that um, in terms of talking about, you know, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And he said, well, it should be 30, 60, and 90 fold. Because um, that was what it, what it was. But actually, it's the 10% difference that will be the people who are willing to pay the cost. You know, but you can do an awful lot with 10%. You know, and God can do an awful lot with 10%. And I would be thrilled if we could get 10% of the world one church embracing these things in reality, because you would change the world. You know, 12 men changed the world. You know, yeah. plus a whole load of ladies behind the scene. You know, so you know you have to you have to choose um, if you want this lifestyle. It doesn't come without a cost of developing these things. You know, if it's easy for you, well, praise God, that's great. But you know, it certainly wasn't easy for me, and it isn't easy for most people, and. I believe that God will enable us. So the purpose for all of it is we want to fulfill our destinies. If we're going to be a real priesthood, we have to operate in beyond the veil. So if we can't go beyond the veil, then we're never going to fulfill the eternal part of our destiny so that heaven can come through on earth through our lives. So if we're going to be manifest sons on the earth, then we really need to be able to see what the Father's doing. Otherwise, we won't be able to do it. You know, yeah, to live a supernatural lifestyle enables us to become a gateway of heaven on earth. You know, God, heaven does want to innate, invade earth, but we need to bring it rather than ask for it to come. He wants to invade earth through us. That's why it needs to be rivers of living water flowing through us and around us, not, oh God, will you come to heaven and, from heaven and do something? No, he's saying you come to heaven and you do something. Yeah. You know, and it's a completely different way of thinking, but actually that's what it is. And God is inviting us to come with him so that then we can bring what we receive there down. And we can do things there also that you can't do here. You know, you cannot administrate in kingdom authority in the courts of heaven without going to the courts of heaven. You know, and you can't go and stand in the presence of God if you don't go to heaven. So we have to learn how to do it and we can develop our ability to see and walk in that light and access the heavenly realms. And that's really why it's worth practicing because it's really worth it when you engage and when you begin to fulfill your destiny and when you begin to outwork the greater works of Jesus. You know, and everything just becomes 
this is what I was created for. You know, that's what it feels for me. You know, for so long, I just was like, you know, I still haven't found it, and now I have, and it's like I'm home. You know, it's where I was always intended to be, uh, and where God created me to be, to live with him, and to bring what's with him here so that we're here would reflect what's with him. <clears throat> so that's, you know, part of it. So being naturally supernatural, seeing from a heavenly spiritual perspective, you know, hearing the voice of God and being led by the Spirit, Romans 8, 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You know, it's just how do we get led by the Spirit? We become led by the Spirit by being one Spirit. So therefore we need to be joined to the Lord, to be one Spirit with Him. How do you get joined to the Lord? Take on the yoke of Jesus, you know, engage God on the seat of rest on the inside of us and, and all that begin to flow out. So we can live in dual realms. And I think that's that's the ultimate, I think, that God wants, is that we can live with him, live here, bring there to here, and we terraform the place and get it back to what it should have been if the garden had filled the earth. Because right. the garden was supposed to fill the rest of the earth. Mm -hmm. It was the place that was the beginning of world conquest because they were supposed to subdue the rest of the earth and have dominion over it. Um, and so we can do that. And actually, that is our mission is to answer creation's groan and bring the whole of the created order back into alignment with God's purpose. Now, for some people, think, well, that's just impossible. It isn't. You know, it will happen. Whether we're involved in it is our choice. But it will happen. Because if you don't fulfill your destiny, God will give it to somebody else. You know, I'm doing stuff now that I was not first choice for. I was just willing when other people said no. Now, I don't feel aggrieved by that. I just feel blessed. I just get to do more stuff. You know, because the parable of the talents is real. You know, if you have a wrong view of God, which is what the religious system creates, then you'll be afraid. And you'll bury it. Because you'll think, oh, God is going to punish me if I get it wrong. You know, he's harsh. And he's this and he's not. He's a loving father who only wants the best for us. And he desires that above all things. Uh, so, you know, we can use the things that God's given us and fulfill our destiny. And if we do, those people who buried their talents, he'll give to us. So you just get to do more stuff. You know, and as much as I want everyone to fulfill their destiny, I want the destiny of God to be fulfilled. So if that means me doing stuff that other people were going to do, then I will. You know, but I want to do my own stuff first. You know? <laughs> um, you know. So we need to develop our spiritual senses, you know, the gateways of our souls, body, spirit. It's important to get a flow. You know, I'm not going to go into all that now. So we can see and know and hear and perceive and understand. So it's like tuning in to develop what's happening all the time. You know, and that can be visual, audio, intuitive impressions, gifts of the spirit, you know, prophecy, knowledge, words of wisdom, distinguishing spirits. You know, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Well, that's great, but that's just this part, this side of the veil. And once you operate on that side of the veil, you find that you don't need the gifts of the Spirit in the same way because you're actually operating in the Spirit. You know, because it, it does talk about the gifts of the Spirit being there until we come to maturity or till the fullness of everything has come. And so it's great to practice that and we're all pretty much familiar with the most of those things and we've all done a lot of those things so that's familiar to us so this is just a development of that in that we do that rather than the spirit does it because they are gifts of the spirit and they're given as he wills whereas when we develop our spiritual senses it's when we will because it's us you know and they're actually you know for us so there are four stages of experience. Faith, engagement, using words and actions. That's just as valid. You know, it's like, by faith, step into heaven. Well, I don't feel anything. I don't see anything. We'll keep doing it. And you will. 
because faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if you have a hope and an expectation that you can engage heaven, it will become substance in your life. So yeah, you know, using words and actions to do that is helpful. You know, visions, snapshot pictures, moving pictures in third person of, often, so you see things. Now, great, we've had those. I mean, I, I always had snapshot pictures of things prophetically, you know, in worship. You know, I always get pictures, um, but I couldn't see. <laughs> it was when I was given a picture, great, but I couldn't see. Visitations, first person, which may involve trances or even translations, um, where you are actually seeing, you know, in your mind, because you're there. Um, now, you can be there in faith. Now, are you really there if you're there in faith? Well, of course you are, because faith is rewarded. And God, faith pleases God. It's just you're learning to go from I'm practicing engaging and choosing to accept that I can step in to I'm actually aware of when I step in the reality of it. But, you know, I think Ian Clayton said that he spent 12 months stepping in by faith and didn't actually experience anything, but it changed him. So our spirit will engage even if our soul hasn't learned to yet. So when you step in by faith, your spirit is engaging there. You may have not learned to interpret what your spirit is engaged in yet, but it will be engaged. And you, that's what you receive by faith. My spirit is there. And I've found that my spirit receives revelation and is impacted by being in the realm of heaven far more than my cognitive senses. Because... There's a lot of things that I know in my spirit that I don't know in my mind and I'm still able to do them and release it because I do find myself saying things that I don't know cognitively but I do know in the spirit <coughs> and I can remember when I had the encounter that imparted it because it was like, oh, that's that. Because yeah, I, I know when my spirit absorbs things you know, because my mind is unfruitful at the point because sometimes you cannot contain yet in your mind the things that your spirit can receive you know you just can't um, but eventually you will because you'll catch up you know and i found that you know sometimes i've had experiences that it's six months 12 months later that that will get released you know and then i know and it's like oh right now i know but I've always knew in my spirit, you know, and it's like a lot of a lot of these things is not getting caught up with needing to know. You know, I needed to know. You know, I went through that stuff and I needed to know and therefore I wanted to figure it out and I needed to know. And now I don't need to know. And I know an awful lot more. Now I don't need to know because <laughs> you know, I'm now free. You know, I'm, I'm free because I don't need to know. You know, and God is much more likely to give you stuff that you don't need to know. Because yeah. you're not in, con in control, in charge, because you're surrendered. So you're relaxed. And you know, it's, it's much easier. So that goes on to habitations, living in the dual realms of heaven and earth simultaneously. Now that's what I'm practicing doing. Um, and, you know, it, it's not that difficult. You know, I found, I found it, you know, because it's progression, you know, if you can step in and step out, well, you can step in and not step out. You know, sometimes you need to recenter your thinking so that you choose to become aware of that because sometimes we get caught up in the busyness of things and it's just like, uh, and then it's like, no, I just need, I'm not at rest. I'm really sensitive when I'm not at rest now. And then if I'm not at rest, I'll stop. And I will just re-center on rest. Because it's just a reminding myself, hey, God, you're on the throne of my life. You're on the seat of rest. So why do I need to be concerned about anything? Because you're in charge and you're teaching me to rule. You know? So, you know, it's, it's, it is all about learning and growing in it. Um, now, John 3.13, this is, this is the verse in the Amplified Version of the Bible, which 
describes what it was like. And Jesus was saying, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven, dwells, has his home. There, first person, continuous tense. So, you know, it was where he was living and dwelling and had his home and yet he was here. And, and that's really what God wants for us, to be able to do that, live that, that's our life. Um, but you, we all have to learn how to. So, in a lot of the exercises that you know I do, um, you know, are like I describe them as scaffolding for the house. You know, you, when you're building a house, you use scaffolding to put the roof on and the second floor or whatever. Yeah, as soon as you've built the house, then you live in it. You don't have scaffolding up as decoration. You, know, you, you don't you don't use the scaffolding anymore, so you take it away. You know the exercises and all the training things are just so that we can develop a lifestyle. You know I don't do exercises anymore. I just engage with God. No, I did do exercises and I practiced, so I could engage with God. You know, and I learned as I grew and I practiced. You know, and I I mean I used to play a lot of sport. The more I practiced, the better I got. You know, the less I practiced, the worse I got. You know, it, it's just how it is. You know, if you want to be good at something, you do it a lot. And if you really, if you love doing it, then you don't mind. You know, you, you don't mind. You know, I mean, I, my daughter was into tennis and she used to drag me down the tennis court, which was only 100 yards from our house, every day. You know, it's like she would just drag me down there every day. Because she just loved to play tennis. Now, I liked tennis, but I went because actually I wanted to bless her. You know, so I would go down there and hit balls every day because she loved tennis. Well, that's what God's like with us. He'll come with us. You know, he wants to be involved with us. He loves us. So he wants to engage with us. You know, it's, it's us who finds it difficult. He doesn't. He's always there, always available. He's never on holiday. He's never closed. He's always there. So all we have to do is engage with him. You know? And I think if we if we see it as like, you know, the exercises is just the practicing. You know? And, you know, as I say, I don't do any of those things. You know, now my spirit is built um, and my senses are developed. They are continuing to grow and develop in using them. You know, because I use them every day in the experience. You know, you know, and I don't go through, you know, praying in tongues for out loud for five minutes and praying in tongues inside. I mean, I just pray in tongues whenever my spirit leads me to do it. And actually, I'm praying in tongues all the time because I've activated how to pray the tongues from my spirit, not just from my mind or my mouth. You know, and that was a huge breakthrough when I learned how to do that. And I learned by accident. You know, because I was praying in tongues one day and I was actually doing some exercises. It was like because I was you know, teaching some other people to do it. And it was like, OK, well, we're going to pray in tongues out loud for a minute. And then we're going to pray in tongues in our mind. And then we're going to pray in tongues while we're reading the word of God. And we're going to pray in tongues this way and that way. So while they were all doing that, I was starting to sort of tune out what they were doing. And, and, and I found that I felt this sort of bubbling up in my stomach. It wasn't something I'd eat. You know, you know, and it was, it was like, oh, something's, something's active. I feel that my spirit is active. You know, and, and so I sort of asked God about it and it was like, yeah, you can pray without ceasing. You know, and I know all the religious stuff about praying without ceasing and, and it's nonsense. You know, actually it means pray without ceasing. Like, all the time. And my spirit can be active all the time, you know, and I and I practiced that and I focused on, OK, now I'm going to get my spirit to be activated and therefore it's going to be edified and it's going to grow and it's going to develop. And now I practice that my spirit is going to grow outside of my soul and outside of my body. And so I get back to the state that Adam was in my spirits on the outside. Now, it's not radiating glory and shining yet. Um, but it will, you know, once I get some more transfiguration takes place, 
Um, it will, but I'm, I've actually spiritually got it encompassing me. You know, and I can also bring other people into that, into my heart, so they're also within the spirit, and when I step into heaven, I can take them with me. But you can't do that with everybody. You can do that with, with people that you have an intimacy with, that you have a heart for and a desire for, you know, family and wife and husband and things. You know, that you can carry each other in your heart, you know, because you can en encompass that with your spirit. Now, you know, you can't do that with a weak, weedy spirit. You know, if it's not grown strong and edified, it won't have the capacity to expand beyond your soul. And if your soul gates aren't open, it won't be able to go through it. You know, so we have to get that open so that we can flow. So our spirit creates an atmosphere around us. You know, and I practice that. You know, and sometimes I have fun with it. You know, because I think, oh, I wonder, if, I wonder if I can engage with these people and they'll actually feel my spirit going around them. You know, because I just wanted to see. You know, can I can I actually do this and can people engage? You know, and you know, so I look at people's reaction stuff I'm <laughs> when I've when I've got nothing else to do. It's not very often. <laughs> you know. But you know, we're opening our body spirits helps that. Cleansing our soul gates, removing the blockages, they're all part of the process. You know, activating our imaginations. You know, this is this is where the line gets drawn with a lot of people and a lot of things. Even some of the people who are teaching spiritual experiences actually stop at the point of well this is when the holy spirit initiates it rather than when you initiate it because they they're they're afraid of it being new age you know and the reality is it's my imagination god has given it me to see so why shouldn't i use it you know it will get me more from a to b so it's designed you know to do things that expand my level of understanding and experience you know because you can't imagine what you have never experienced if you think about it because you use your thoughts to activate your imagination so the imagination just becomes a doorway to things that you haven't experienced by engaging what you have that's why it's helpful to use the word of god or a picture of something like a door to go through because what you're doing is going through the door that you've created by visualizing it and then once you're through it who knows what's going to happen it's not something that then you're right i'm going through the door then i'm going to imagine this on the other side of the door and this on the other side of the door, this on the other side of the door now you can you know as an exercise i do of thinking okay what's on the other side of the door let's engage it but in general you want to go into the experience which was becomes something that you are not making up you know and this is this is where people well you're just making it up no i used my imagination to picture a door and i walked through it and then i experienced it so whatever was on the other side of the door was not something i imagined i was still seeing it but i was not active actually creating the experience Whereas you can create the door. And that's the point. You know, activate your imagination to create the door, walk through the door, and then you have whatever you have on the other side. And that will be up to what is there for you and what you engage in. You know, and sometimes that was very much directed by God because he wants to reveal something or show you something or you have an experience. Or it becomes, I'm walking on a pathway that's part of me and now I'm going to go and do something in that realm because I can walk there. You know, but it's actually then it's a real actual encounter, not something that's just created in my own mind. And I think that is where a lot of people struggle because they think, well, I'm just making it up. You know, it's like I couldn't make up some of the things I've seen. Right. You know, I couldn't because it's like they're not something I've ever seen before anywhere else. You know, well, me and Metatron's cube, I definitely couldn't make up that. <laughs> yeah. um, but there, there are things like that. I mean, we, we had uh, an encounter with um, our Bento 12, and we, we, were, we wanted to step into heaven, and we wanted to engage our scroll, because we felt there was a new season, and we wanted uh, different perspectives on what was in the new season. So we all stepped in, and, you know, I started to see this 
geometric shape, you know, and, I, and it was like this geometric shape. And I'm like, this is weird. It's like, what on earth is this? You know, and I could see it and it's like, it's a geometric shape, but it's like dimensional in shape. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing this aspect of it and I'm looking through into it. I'm thinking, wow, this is really weird. I don't get anything else. And all, and all this focus on this. So I come out of this thinking, okay, I'm not going to say anything. You know, <laughs> I'm not, not going to say anything. So it's like, so it's like, okay, who wants, who wants to share what they, what they see? So it's like, someone said, someone said something and then, then someone else, will, well, this is really weird, but I saw something like this shape. I said, well, oh, no, 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 I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe what I saw was not quite so weird after all. And like five of us, I think five or six of us out of the 12 of us actually all saw this geometric dimensional shape. And we all saw it from a slightly different perspective. And I thought, well, this is odd. So I, I drew, I tried to draw, I'm not a very good drawing, but I drew it, you know, I drew it on a piece of paper and, and it's like, and some of the others drew it. And they were much better than my drawing. So I didn't show them mine. <laughs> so it looks like this, you know. Um, and they, um, they showed me theirs and it was like, okay, we're, we're something, something is in this. You know, this is not insignificant. That We've all seen something from a perspective that is not normal to see this shape. And so, you know, I sort of went back to God and said, well, what is this? You know, get, what, what is this? And, you know, and it turns out, you know, it's something called Metatron's cube. And, you know, I was to the Todd earlier and showed him some pictures of it because he saw something either as well. It's like, you know, um, and there's a whole lot of sort of stuff out there on Metatron's cube, which is, you know, suspect. Yeah, as a better word, but there's also a lot of things that actually is real. And Metatron, again, you know, is, is this chief angel of the order of chaos. And um, it represents a dimensional understanding of how how everything works. You know, and I mean, I, I saw a, a thing on one of the TED um TED Talks and it was this astrophysicist or quantum physicist I know which one talking about eight dimensional things and he said look this is how all the forces are weak forces strong forces whatever and it's like he drew this thing he said I'm going to try it. I've got this program that puts it into a dimensional thing and it was like whoa this is Metatron's cube yeah. you know and it, it was how all the dimensions interact and I went well what's the purpose of that and I was like okay God wouldn't have showed us if it wasn't important. And then my wife actually ended up in this cube. Now, this is really not usual for her, you know, to, to be in this thing. So she's saying, I'm in this sapphire cube. And so I'm laughing, thinking, you know, wow, you're on a slippery slope here. <laughs> so it's like, so she sort of starts describing, you know, being in this cube. And, and it's like, and it's somewhere I'd been and I hadn't, actually said because i don't share a lot of things so i don't want to influence people yeah. to try and see the things that i've seen so usually i confirm things after people have shared because that's much safer because you don't want to create where you want people just to be trying to see what you're seeing rather than having their own experiences so i hadn't really shared that i'd been in this cube myself but when i was in there it was like where it talks about you know the manifold wisdom of god and the manifold grace of God, it was like all these facets of like looking into a diamond and seeing into the diamond and seeing even more facets and then looking and seeing into a facet and seeing even more. And it was just this amazing expression of the, the wisdom and grace of God in a cube. And you think, well, why was it a cube? Well, when I actually then went and meditated on it and went back into engage God with it, he basically showed me that when Moses was given um, the tablets, which we have interpreted as tablets in the word, actually he was given a cube. And when you look back to Hebrew, that's what he received. He received a cube which contained all the revelatory information that he needed to bring the kingdom onto the earth and how all the governmental things of heaven worked. But of course, they had a big mess up and he smashed it up you know and then chiseled out some in rock yeah which wasn't quite the same <laughs> <laughs> you missed something in translation he did a lot yeah 
Um, because I, you know, I haven't got time to go into it, but there is so much information encoded in crystal, you know, because the river of life is a crystal river and you get gems that come on the bottom of the river and they all contain facets of God, like insight into something of the, of the character of God or the nature of God or the purpose of God. It's like a facet. And when you, if you, if you ever get through the dark cloud, because I never actually explained actually what I happened when I got through the dark cloud and I actually saw God face to face, you know, not his person, not his presence, but his person, you know, I didn't stay there very long. I mean, it absolutely just exploded my consciousness really. Um, but I saw his face. Now I knew Ian Clayton said, don't look into his eyes because you might not come back. You know, so I was like, I'm not going to look in his eyes. So I, so I looked at his face down here and just avoided his eyes. And it's like, it was just like encrusted with multifacets and shimmering with blue and fire and colors. I mean, it was an amazing sight. Um, but it, it was just so overwhelming. I mean, I remember Ian Clayton saying that, you know, the spirit of knowledge, you know, got him to pick up a blade of grass or something and it had more knowledge in the blade of grass than anything that he knew so he just dropped it quickly because he couldn't contain it and the spirit of knowledge just laughed you know um because actually you know it's like because i think his, his attitude was i want to know everything about god you know so it's like well pick up this braid of grass and it was more about god in that braid of grass than everything he knew <laughs> just completely like whoa you know because i mean it's like god is like infinite and eternal and amazing and just to look in his face um, was and I couldn't stay there for you know I can't think of how many microseconds I managed to stay in there first time I went in there because it was just just too much you know and that was just one facet but when you looked into it was multifaceted and if you looked into one facet it was multifaceted and that's what God's like deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper but we can go deeper and deeper and deeper um, and it all starts with going through the door you know it starts with learning to see so you know, i'm taking a heck of a long time doing this because it's like you know this should have been a 10 minute thing but anyway yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're doing good <laughs> <laughs> so practice you know that's the key practice same thing um so you know, speaking, singing in tongues is a key part of activating and developing our spiritual sense. It really is, you know, because it's a language of the spirit. And the vibrational frequency of that language aligns ourselves with the realm of heaven. You know, it, it's a dimensional vibrational frequency that aligns you. So it opens up heaven for you. You know, and that's why that's why the language of the spirit is really, really important. And if you can be praying in the spirit or speaking in tongues all the time even though you're not consciously aware of it then you're going to be continually connected to that realm and that's really what it does you know it actually connects you in that frequency to that realm so it's the language of the spirit now and you can speak in tongues out loud you can speak in tongues in your mind and you can speak continuously in your spirit that just keeps communicating if it's got somewhere to go you know and that's why the soul needs to be involved. Um, because if it hasn't got anywhere to flow, then you're stuck. You know, so, you know a stagnant pool is not a pleasant thing. You know, um, and so the River of Jordan that flows into the Dead Sea, the River of Jordan's great. The Dead Sea's not so great because there's nothing coming out the other side. Essentially, it just stays there and evaporates until it's so heavy with salt you can float in it. But if you drink it, look out. You know, because it's really full of deadly salts you know? but it started off with a living river and ended up that way so we must make sure everything flows through us um, yeah. so you know you know some of these scriptures wait on the lord renew your strength be still and know that i'm god you know cease striving let be and be still and know that i'm god which is the amplified version you know cease striving that is the key don't strive and struggle, relax, chill, enjoy it. You know? So that's, that's Jesus yep. for me. Um, that's how he looked. And when I saw that picture that uh, Akiana painted, it was just like, that's him. You know, 
you know, and I, I love that thing in that that film, Heaven Is Real, when the little boy said, "That's him," you know, because they didn't real, they didn't believe that he was real, you know, and you know, I I purchased that online. You know, I was going to get a big canvas, but it was like. I thought, actually, well, I can just purchase the image and you can print it out. So I printed it out on big canvas. <laughs> um, but that that's how Jesus appeared when it was like Jesus, not wanting to give me revelation of anything or him on the cross. You know, that that's how he appeared. You know, and I love in his eye, looking in his eyes and engaging him. So I want to encourage you to use pictures as a doorway. You know, don't be afraid of using an image to activate your imagination. You know, if you want to know what it's like to walk through a door, open a door and walk through it. You know, because then you've got an anchor for the experience, which then you can use to activate your imagination. So, you know, everyone can close their eyes and picture something. You know, and you just have to practice doing it and picture the right stuff. So picture doors and rivers and things that are in the word of God because they then enable you to enter into the word and it becomes living and active and alive and you can experience it. So, you know, there's Jesus. It always helps to fix your eyes on Jesus. If you're going to meditate, don't empty your head. Fill it. Emptying your head is an invitation for stupid stuff to come into it. You know, or even worse. So don't ever empty your head, fill it. And so fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And even thinking about him being the author and finisher of our faith helps you engage in what was. Because he wrote everything about us from the beginning. So he's the author, the beginning, and he's the finisher, the end. And we can engage in that. And even scriptures like that take on a new meaning once you understand that you can actually engage in him. You know, so fix your eyes on Jesus. That's the key. So I'd encourage you to, to do that. If you need to look at the image, then you can look at it and have a glance at it. But then what I do encourage you to, to basically just prepare yourself, which means relax. So close your eyes and relax. And just, you know, for a couple of minutes, just begin to pray in tongues and just tune out. Tune out from everything else that's around you. And then you can begin to tune in. And what I'd encourage you to do is to, is to relax. And to deliberately choose to cast all your burdens onto Jesus. Because Jesus promises to be with us and never leave us or forsake us. So he's with us right now. So actually just begin to picture that Jesus is kneeling in front of you right now. His arms are out and he's asking you to offload all the burdens, all the expectations, anything that you're carrying, any concerns that you've got, anything that you're thinking about which is a hindrance or a distraction. Just begin to think about him. And just choose deliberately just to hand all those burdens over to him. And just feel how light it is that you're not weighed down by those things anymore. So you can just think about him and engage with him. You know, and if you want to enter into a conversation with him, then just begin to talk. And you talk by just the thoughts in your mind directed towards him. And then receive the thoughts that he gives as he replies and talks to you.
So while you're in that just relaxed place, while you're just feeling light, not weighed down or burdened, we're just gonna just engage practicing how to meditate in the Word. And you know, when I learned to meditate in the Word, all I did was I just used to speak the Word out to myself, one word at a time in a phrase, and I allowed while I did it the thoughts of God just to fill my mind with revelation of that Word. You know, and I used very simple scriptures that just were experiential to open that up um, and you know I want to encourage you again just relax and just listen to this very well-known scripture and I can enter into this myself because I've recorded it um, and I'm going to listen to myself and allow the thoughts of God about this scripture to become revelation and reality for me it's going to be still and know that he's gone.
Now you can also learn to meditate through visualizing and picturing and engaging. So again, just be conscious that when you do these exercises, you can be praying in tongues that engages your spirit in and receives the revelation of it. You can use tongues in everything, you know, whether it's in your mind or in your spirit, just let your spirit active, that your spirit is engaging and experiencing. So again, we're gonna do another one of those exercises again using Psalm 23. So I wanna encourage you to, as you listen to Psalm 23, just begin to picture yourself in the green pasture, lying down beside the quiet waters, the Lord, your shepherd, with you. And just enter into that experience as you just listen to the psalm. And there may be a particular part of that that really engages you, that you begin to focus on and begin to experience. But again, just, just relax and <clears throat> Begin to think about that green pasture and the Lord being your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup. So, you know, you can just stay in that sort of relaxed place. You know, for me, those type of experiences are sort of very open. So in my first intention there was to dive in the river. You know, and I, I went in the river and went under the water and found a scroll. And so don't be limited by the scripture or the word let it be a doorway into personal experience and encounter. You, know, you can you know, activate your imagination so you open the eyes of your heart and begin to look, begin to see. Um, and if you want to do it with any particular thing, you can use a, an object. You can think of a door, you can think of a river, you can think of Jesus, you can think of heaven, you can think of the stairway going up to heaven, Jacob's ladder, anything, you know, and it starts by thinking about it. And as soon as you fix your eyes to think about it, then you can begin to focus on visualizing it on the screen of your imagination. And once you begin to see it, then engage it and then walk up the ladder or go into the river or open the door and, and walk through. And then just allow that natural picture or image just to become the doorway to your, your experience. Yeah. And you can use a previous experience 
you know, all the experiences I get, I plant in the garden of my heart and I can go and eat the fruit of the tree. And it just opens up an entrance back into that experience because it's my testimony. And the testimony gives you that access point. You know, you know, it's helpful to use images that have some sort of spiritual meaning because then when you engage in, you know, further activities, you're very used to using the door to go through or climbing the ladder into the realms of heaven. So I want you to just activate that right now. So close your eyes and actually just think about a door. Maybe your front door, maybe the door to this building. Just actually think about a door. And as you begin to think about that door, you know, what sort of handles it got? You know, what sort of glass has it got? Is it, what color is it? If you think about that, then just begin to picture the door. Usually something that's familiar to you is, is easier to visualize, but actually you can create any door. It doesn't have to be something you've already seen. You know, think about a red door. Think about a blue door. Think about a green door. Practice just visualizing the things you think about. Then think about a river. Is it gently flowing? Is it fast flowing? Is it blue? Is it green? Just think about a river. Think about standing next to the river. Think about looking at the river. Just visualize that river. Think about Jesus. And then just begin to picture him. And then begin to talk to him. And then wait for him to talk to you. Whether you're getting a full Technicolor movie experience or just an impression, just allow all your senses to engage. Let your emotions engage. What do you feel like when you think about Jesus and when you begin to picture Jesus? What is your emotions? Is it excitement and joy? Is it a sense of peace? A sense of love? Just allow all your senses to engage. You know, allow your body to connect so that you feel warm and peaceful and safe and secure. Now, uh, we're going to just do an exercise that was the first visual exercise I ever did. And I still love using it because I really enjoy experiencing it myself. So I encourage you again just to, to relax. Just uh, as I sort of share it, just picture a beach. And so, if you want to see a beach, there's a picture on the screen if you're not used to beaches. I was brought up in a seaside town with five beaches, so beaches are really easy for me to visualize. But just think about the beach. Just relax. And just be just consciously breathing slowly in and out and just get into that place of relaxation sometimes it helps just to move all the muscles and just relax them so that you're in a place where you're at rest then I want to encourage you just to think of yourself walking towards the beach slowly it's a warm sunny day 
the distance, the deep blue sea is just shimmering in the background. There's a gentle breeze just blowing. Just kick off your shoes and just feel the sand between your toes. then just walk slowly across the sand towards the sea. And you just walk towards the edge of the water and you just feel the cool water lapping against your feet. And as you look along the shore, you see someone walking towards you. Slowly, as he gets closer, you know that it's Jesus. And Jesus just joins you paddling in the water. And you just feel a sense of peace and joy and love in his presence. He just places his hand on your shoulder and just looks into your eyes and reassures you. You just feel his love and compassion for you. just looks into your eyes and you know he's looking deep into your soul and he gently just asks you how are you how do you feel and from those recesses of your soul that he's looked into if there's anything you want to share with him or unburden yourself of because he knows just share with him your deepest desires the desires of your heart understands you, he knows everything about you, and he loves you. Allow him to unlock those deep recesses. Allow him to unlock anything that's hidden subconsciously. Just open your heart to him. And as you open your heart, just feel his love and peace just fill you. Just bringing you deeper and deeper and deeper into that place of wondrous joy and peace. Now Jesus just kneels down in the sand and he writes in the sand something just for you. Just look and see what he's written. Just feel his heart for you. Just the wonder of his love.
and he just begins to tell you how special you are to him, how much you mean to him. Now it's just time to walk back off the beach. And as you walk back, carrying in your heart that special revelation that he's given you, that knowledge that he's with you. And even though you're walking, he's still with you that you can be conscious of his presence all day, every day, because he dwells within your heart. So, in, uh, in these type of experiences, you, know, you can use the Word of God as an access point. Yeah, so there may be a biblical picture or scene that you would really like to experience. Yeah, so you can use any scripture you know, that's experiential and you can enter into that scene. Again, you know, Psalm 23 is a really good one. We've already done that one. But, you know, particularly, you know, I encourage you to actually um, use the understanding of the, 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 your spirit and the first love gate. That's a really important one to get used to opening every day. And so, you know, you can use the Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And you can use that scripture because that is the door that's of the kingdom that's in your heart, in your spirit and the handle's on your side. So you have to open it. So when I, when I do this exercise, you know, I think of a door. You know, now I know what the door looks like in my own spirit because I've been there so much. And, you know, again... Often I, I didn't really focus on what things looked like. I just wanted to, to get up close and personal with, with Jesus or the Father who came through the door. Um, but when I started doing exercises with people, I did take a little bit more careful to look. You know, what does my spirit look like? Because you know, all I was focused on is I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. It's like I'm just engaging Jesus. So one day I was like looking around. I thought, actually, my spirit's a mountain. You know, I'm on the top of a mountain here. You know, and, and it was like... I don't know if you know Star Trek transporter beam. It was like there was this huge column of shimmering light that was like a transporter beam, that the, and there was a door in it. And that was the realm of the kingdom, which went right up into the realm of heaven. But it's in my spirit. And as I open the door, you know, I welcome the presence of God to come into me, but the door is then open. And the river of life flows through that door. Most of us have a trickle that comes under the threshold because we don't open it. So we live on a trickle. But when you open it, it becomes ankle deep. And you can stand in the ankle deep water because the river just flows out. And then you can walk with that river because it becomes deeper, knee deep, waist deep, until it's a river flowing, ready to flow out as rivers, streams, you know, and it's, you know, the streams that make glad people of God. And so, you know, again, you can experience the river when you open that door. You can experience, hey, Jesus is going to come through or the Father and they're going to embrace me. You, know, you just have to choose to open the door because you know, he's knocking and it says if you hear my voice. So I imagine he's saying something like, you know, let me in or let me out depending on which way you think of it, uh, and both, because he's in the realm of the kingdom, but you want the realm of the kingdom to fill you, 
So you have to invite him to come from that realm so that that realm of the kingdom is your whole spirit. And then that realm of the kingdom where he rules is your whole soul because you allow him to flow through each gateway. And then it fills your whole body. So the realm of the kingdom where he rules is the whole of you. And then when it flows out of your body as rivers, then it contains the whole dimension around you. you know? And you can just practice actually seeing that and feeling it and releasing your spirit to be joined with him so that it flows. You know? And all that just becomes a practice. Now, now it's no longer a practice for me. It's every day it just happens. I just live that way. You know, I consciously create that you know, as my spirit just grows and envelops my soul and body and I live like that, you know. So, let's, let's look, just do that with just the, the door. So again, if you know, if you, if you want to picture a door, you can go over there, you know, or you can picture that door in your own spirit into the realm of the kingdom. Um, so first of all, just think about the door. You can think about the color, the size, the shape. For some, it's like a big gateway. For some, it's an arched doorway. For some, whatever your doorway is, just begin to think about it and picture it. And just see yourself standing in front of it. And there's the door handle. And you hear a gentle knocking on the door. You hear Jesus just whispering, just let me in. So just choose to reach out and open the door. And as you reach out and open the door, just sense the river of life just flowing through that doorway just lapping around your ankles refreshing cool and just sense Jesus just come and embrace you feel his arms around you feel the life his love joy and peace just the way the truth and the life just envelop you surround you with his presence safe and secure in his arms just allow your heart to melt and surrender just surrounding you just be conscious that you can step into him you can be surrounded by his presence the way, the truth, the life and just be open for wherever he goes Wherever he takes you, he may take you for one of your gateways, he may take you deeper into the river, he may even take you into the garden of your heart. And you know, if he takes you into the garden of your heart, again, just be prepared to lie down and talk with him and share with him, or go into the river. him to open up that realm and to lead you as you're with walking with him
Just sense him reveal himself to you deeper and deeper. He's your savior. He's your peace and joy. He's your high tower, your healer, your restorer, makes you whole. He's the lover of your soul. Just feel the embrace of his love and go deeper and deeper into that experience. Now he is the bread of life. Let him speak those words to you. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I am the door. these experiences they leave a deposit they become your experience and you can enter back into them anytime you wish you step through the veil open the door engage the river they just become your personal testimony of intimacy of relationship of fellowship So while you're still there, I just want to encourage you to enter another scene. This is one of my favorites. This gives you a, an opportunity to engage in dialogue. But Jesus was sat on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And they basically said to him, tell us. So think about Jesus just sitting with his disciples. Just think about that scene. you need a image to help there's one on the screen and just begin to think about and picture yourself 
just sat down with Jesus, with his disciples, and he's talking to them. He's sharing things with them. place you're sat there with him and Jesus just looks at you and he starts to speak to you he starts to tell you and reveal your destiny starts to unveil his plan and purpose for your life. I'm looking into that scene I can see Jesus just take out a scroll and just unfurl the scroll and just begin to to show you something of the revelation of his purpose and his destiny for you pictures, it may have impressions on it. Just be open to engage your spirit with that scroll. Just let it stir your heart. As the words from that scroll just get written on your heart. As the pictures just get engraved on your heart. the desires of your heart begin to be drawn towards that plan and purpose that he has for you.
Okay. Man. Yeah, all these sort of experiences are more about the intimacy and the pathway of relationship and you know, there's so many of them you can engage with. I mean, you know, there's there's no limit to you know, their encounters with that place of intimacy, you know, developing the garden of your heart and all those things. Yeah. So you use the word of God so it becomes living and active and you can experience it. You know, it's no longer just something you read, it's something you enter into. And you you have that then as the record stored within your memory. So, you know, use all your senses. Sometimes you may cry. You know, sometimes you may feel like laughing. You know, go with it. You know, don't restrict anything. You know, let's be really open you know, to fully experience everything that you need to experience there. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. If you fall asleep in any of those things, it's a great place to fall asleep. <laughs> Rest. In his rest, you know, don't ever feel condemned. Oh no, I fell asleep. It's just like what a what a great place to rest, you know. And don't think that your spirit can't continue to receive while you not off, because you can practice going to sleep when your spirit's still engaging. I do it every night, you know. I allow my spirit. I always think about engaging and offer my spirit to God every night. Anything it wants to do with me, you know, while I, you know just drift off into that place and you know sometimes I wake up with revelation sometimes I wake up with a sense of oh I was doing some stuff last night hi everyone we're starting a patreon page patreon.com slash freedom arc and we would like to invite you to partner with us in taking the message of God's unconditional love limitless grace triumphant mercy to a bigger global audience